So good afternoon and uh, welcome to uh, the 2018 Kavli Symposium on the Frontiers of Physics. I'm Megan Aronson. Uh, I'm the uh, chair of the Division of Condensed Matter Physics of the American uh, Physical Society and the, chair and, uh, the program chair for this meeting. Uh, I'd like to start uh, by uh, 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 expressing APS's uh, gratitude uh, for the generous support of the Kavli Foundation. Uh, they are helping to underwrite uh, the costs of uh, this uh, special symposium. So in all of its programs, the Kavli Foundation has the support of excellent science uh, as its uh, hallmark uh, feature. Uh, and so the APS is therefore honored to have its uh, support for this special symposium that celebrates the scientific accomplishments and the seminal work uh, of the five individuals who will be speaking with us uh, this afternoon. I wanted to announce before we begin that our third speaker, uh, Ming Yi, uh, ha has uh, been taken ill, and so she won't be with us this afternoon, uh, but that uh, Ivan Schuller uh, will be stepping uh, into that slot. I'd like to introduce our first speaker, uh, who's Professor Barry Barish uh, from Caltech, uh, and he'll be telling us today about the work uh, that has led to his uh, receiving the 2017 Nobel Prize in Physics. Uh, please join me uh, in welcoming Barry. Well, I, I think for all of us, the first exposure we had to gravity was from Newton and maybe elementary school or junior high school or something when our teacher told us that uh, if we jumped up, the earth pulled us down or the apple falling out of the tree or why the moon goes around the earth. Uh, and actually, he basically wrote down this little formula that uh, satisfied our need to do gravity almost for 250 years. And he called it universal gravity. He wrote it in the Principia, which is also where he wrote down the scientific method. There's, after almost 250 years or 230 years, there was only one place where it didn't work perfectly that was known. And that was the orbit of Mercury around the sun, our closest a planet to the sun, going around the sun is very elliptical in its orbit, uh, is affected by the position of all the planets, and if you calculate the distance between the using Newton's and Kepler's laws, Newton's theory, Kepler's laws, uh, the distance that it moves each time uh, can be calculated and comes out about 10% different than Newton's numbers. Uh, that was believed by most people to be due to the fact that maybe we didn't know all the planets. There may have been one or some matter between Mercury and the Sun itself. And in fact, even well after Einstein, uh, serious space missions looked for uh, material between Mercury and the Sun and didn't find it. So this certainly wasn't a big motivation for, for Einstein to develop a new theory of gravity. But he did. So he developed a new theory of gravity, which came out in 1915, 10 years after he solved several of the most important problems in physics in a matter of months. Uh, he spent 10 years then developing the theory of general relativity. Uh, that theory, which I won't talk about in detail because I'm going to talk about an experiment mostly, that, that theory was probably not motivated by Mercury around the sun, but by first continuing the job he started with uh, relativity, special relativity in, two, in 1905, uh, by adding accelerations, which basically adds gravity to the problem. Uh, secondly, there are a couple basic issues that he understood, even Newton understood, with Newton's theory of gravity. It's not a theory. Uh, we use a formula to describe why or how an apple falls to the ground or the, and it goes as the inverse square of the distance. Uh, he didn't know what the constant was. It took another 100 years to determine what the constant was. Uh, but he also didn't say how or why, why the Earth pulls on us. So that was the first problem, which Einstein gave at least a description of why uh, something would go, the Earth would go around the moon. Secondly, it has a kind of fundamental flaw, and that is instantaneous action at a distance. 
meaning that, for example, if the sun were to burn out, it takes seven seconds for light to get here, but the gravi any effect of gravity would get here immediately. So uh, Einstein's theory basically has finite speed of information or action, uh, information, and that's basically the speed of light. There's one constant in his, in his formulation, and that's the speed of light. The theory itself basically is very difficult to handle theoretically and calculate because it's four-dimensional. It combines space and time together, it, which actually is a very hard concept not understood yet by Bill Gates because he puts a little wavy line under space-time when I write it down. So it's very difficult to understand it, but some of it is maybe more understandable uh, schematically. So basically, it is a warpage of space-time that we describe, hard to describe in four dimensions, so we keep talking about it in pictures like the one I drew up here, which is two-dimensional or three-dimensional. Uh, this is a picture then of the a schematic of the sun and the earth. The sun distorting space, which is shown in the grid below. Each, each intersection there has a different, uh, is distorted in both space dimension, which I show physically, but also time. And, uh, and then there's a little dip underneath the earth, as you see also. So he has this picture, but he also used it to basically try to convince, uh, convince us that general relativity has, is right and that this picture is right, because if we have a distortion of space-time, it doesn't matter whether the particle that's near the Earth or the Sun is massive or massless. And so it could be massless. If it's massless, it'll follow the same kind of uh, distortions that are here. And a follow-up of that then is that the, if, if you have light that comes near the sun, it'll get bent. And so he calculated how much it gets bent and predicted that, made it a, a, an experimental proposal basically, that if you looked at the eclipse of, a sun, of the sun at the same time stars went behind the sun, the light would bend, and he calculated exactly how much it would bend. Uh, that experiment was done three years later, in four years later, in 1919 by Sir Arthur Eddington. And uh, the result was exactly as Einstein had predicted. That basically was what made Einstein a household name. It was uh, uh, that experiment. I'm not gonna talk any more much about general relativity ex itself except the other prediction that he made. Within a year, in 1916, he predicted that gravity would have waves, just like electromagnetism has waves. And in fact, in the 1916 paper that I put up here, he doesn't develop that concept from basic principles, but rather from analogy with electromagnetism. He noticed that if he sets up the equations of general relativity in a certain way, uh, uh, that the uh, form is very much like the wave equation in waves, and therefore he made the leap uh, that uh, gravity must also have waves, gravitational wave, what we call gravitational waves. So that was the beginning. He actually uh, made some mistakes in that paper. Uh, he fixed them in 1918. He didn't admit the mistakes, he just went on. Uh, there was a mistake of a factor of two, which would have been hard for us when we tried to measure this. Uh, but anyway, he, in 1918, published a second paper that uh, fixed the factor of two error, and more importantly for the experimental work, which I've done, uh, is he talked about the source of how you make gravitational waves. And in contrast to electromagnetism, where we do it by a dipole uh, oscillating, in this case, it's a quadrupole. So if something that has a quadrupole moment is what will give uh, gravitational waves. Okay, so gravitational waves themselves are basically a ne necessary consequence then of finite speed of information travel and special relativity. Uh, they come about from accelerations of masses. So if we talk about physical things that can give gravitational waves, it's not just 
gravity itself, but the phenomenon will be the acceleration of masses. That acceleration of masses has to geometrically somehow have a quadrupole moment. And that's the kind of uh, structure, the kind of events that we look for. I've here, I'm not gonna go through, I've got my assumptions up there, just written down uh, in the weak field limit just to demonstrate that the equations of general relativity written in this way, which I've done, which anybody can do, look very much like the wave equation. And the little h mu nu here is exactly what we'll end up measuring as I show you the experiment. So we take it then that the uh, gravitational waves themselves obey the wave equation. This is called the strain, h mu nu. And the h mu nu is basically the physical parameter that we're able to measure. Therefore, looking at the wave equation, we have waves, and they tr propagate plane waves in the same way as electromagnetism. But notice in my drawing that they propagate not perpendicular to each other, but at 45 degrees to each other. And that's due to the fact that gravity is spin two while uh, electromagnetism is spin one. We can, even though the experiment that I'll talk about is a classical experiment, much like Hertz's experiment was a classical experiment, we can, un, uh, we, can, uh, we can decompose the two components of the gravitational waves and determine how much is in one component or the other, which in a sense is showing that gravity is spin two, even though our experiment is uh, uh, a classical physics experiment. The kind of collision that I'll talk about and that we've observed, which is one of many different sources that we believe can give gravitational waves, is shown in this illustration here. Two objects going around each other, just like the Earth and the, and the Moon or the Earth and the Sun, uh, captured somehow going around each other. They have their own spins, as you can see here. And as they go around each other, they radiate away some energy due to the accelerations. The accelerations give gravitational waves that carries away energy. Because of that, they spiral in slowly, and eventually they come together and they merge. The first part of this diagram is that in spiral, and that's the part that we can calculate quite well. And it's what we use to look for gravitational uh, waves. The merger itself is physically probably the most interesting part because it's really understanding strong gravity when the merger really happens. Uh, there we can't pred predict it in the same way. Uh, and one of our goals in the future is to measure that very well. And finally, everything about the merger, the spins, all the other things have to uh, settle down and so there's a ring down at the end which also has a characteristic uh, frequency. On the right here, I show three different cases just to illustrate when I talk about the experiment that depending on the masses of these objects, the heavier they are, the lower frequency they are when they collide. If they're lighter, they collide at somewhat higher frequency. You'll see that in the experimental data that I show by the fact that we barely can go down to low enough frequency to see the heaviest ones and they just barely enter, enter our instrument, and then the other ones are enter it for a very long time. And, and I'll mention uh, neutron star collisions, which are very light and are in our apparatus and oscillating for uh, 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 many seconds. Okay, so the quadrupole moment that we pick, that we're looking for in what I'll concentrate on today is the merger of two objects going around each other. That's all pretty simple, but if I put in the numbers, which I'll do for you, in the formulas that I more or less showed in the previous slide, the, the numbers that we have from the data, which I'll come to later, are that the masses of the two objects that we detected, at least the first ones, are about 30 times the mass of our sun. Uh, when we start seeing them, they're about 100 kilometers apart. Uh, we measure them with a frequency of about 100 hertz, and uh, they're about 1.3 billion light years away from us. If I put all those numbers in, the actual strength, this little h that I wrote, is 10 to the minus 21. That's the number to grab for how hard this experiment is and why it took 100 years. That number, however, the strain, is proportional to the physical thing that we measure. That is, the cha a change of length due to the uh, 
uh, distortion of space and time over the length itself. So the job as an experimentalist is to measure somehow when a gravitational wave goes through an instrument, the fact that the length that you measure for that instrument is gonna change by one part in 10 to the 21. So let's look at that. If I make it uh, a ring of free particles, then if a gravitational wave goes through it, what it'll, it will do is stretch it in one direction for half a wavelength, and then it'll stretch it in the other direction and squash it in that direction for a half a wavelength. The amount is this little h, and so what we expect to see if we have a, a ring that was one meter in size is a change of 10 to the minus 21 meters. Therefore, we try to make the number somewhat bigger by making an apparatus that's kilometers in size instead of meters in size. This is the challenge. If I summarize it simply, as simply as I could on one slide, we have to measure this little strain, which is a delta L over L, to one part in 10 to the 21. Uh, we make it four kilometers long. That means we're measuring it to something like four 10 to the minus 18 meters which is about a thousandth the size of a proton. In order to do that, the experimental challenges are two. One, if you've ever used an interferometer, is we lock it on, a, on whatever the frequency or the wavelength is of the light we use, and you talk about fringes and splitting a fringe, splitting a wavelength. In our case, we have to split it to 10 to the 12th, which is pretty amazing. The second is that we're doing this experiment on the surface of the Earth. And on the surface of the Earth, we work where the Earth is the quietest, which happens to be the audio band, because that's where, where our ears are made to work, because it doesn't shake as much there. But even there, the shaking of the Earth is 10 to the 12th times larger than we can tolerate to do this experiment. So in contrast to interferometers that you may have used in a freshman or sophomore, physics lab, we isolate it from the Earth instead of putting it on an optical table, and we reduce the shape, shake, shaking of the Earth by a total of 10 to the 12th in order to make the measurement. So the idea is shown here in the simple-minded terms. We start with a laser and split the beam in two directions. Remembering the, the picture that I drew of what happens when a gravitational wave comes through, if nothing's going through, it takes the same amount of time to go down one arm as the other. The light, when it comes back, basically can be inverted and made to cancel, and the sensor sees nothing. But if arms change like this, I've done it a few times a second here, uh, and due to the passage of a gravitational wave, then it's a different amount of time to go down one arm and the other. When it comes back, it doesn't quite cancel, and we see light. So that's the idea. Uh, the implementation I'll just talk about a little bit. We made two detectors right from the beginning, uh, 3,000 kilometers apart. One is in the state of Louisiana, in a small, near a small town called Livingston and the other in Hanford, Washington, on the DOE, large DOE reservation in uh, Hanford, although we have nothing to do with the DOE except using the land. They're 3,000 kilometers apart. So if a gravitational wave were to go through the, them, and we could detect the gravitational wave, if it comes this way, it'll enter this detector 10 milliseconds before this detector. Or if it comes this way, 10 milliseconds here before this detector. Or if it came straight down, they'd be the same time. So we know that if a gravitational wave which travels at the speed of light comes, the two detectors are constrained to give a signal within 10 milliseconds of each other, plus or minus 10 milliseconds. We use the times where they're not in coincident to understand the whole background situation, how much they make signals that might look like our own when they're out of time with each other. But to see a real signal, they have to be in time. The detectors themselves are identical, and the geography is very non-identical. In Louisiana, we're basically on swampy, wet land, uh, shown here. And you can see on the side a lot of water. That's because we have to build it up to the 500-year floodplain to last. And uh, as soon as you go a millimeter or so below the ground level, there's water. 
Hanford, the other one, is high desert. Despite the fact that they look so different here, the performance is identical as long as we keep things the same in them. The inside, which is almost all I'll show technically, are a bunch of big vats like this. They have the, the optics and the sensors and all that in them. They have a lot of ports and things. It's not quite as simple as the picture that I drew, partially because it isn't as simple. And secondly, when we built LIGO at the beginning, which is in the 1990s, we didn't really know how to make it as sensitive as 10 to the minus 21. And in order to do that, we tried to make an infrastructure that was flexible enough so that any way we could imagine evolving the instrument, we can incorporate in the same infrastructure. And people who have built big things, I think, recognize immediately that the infrastructure always costs much more than the, uh, the, the, detect the fancy detectors you use. So what limits this technique? A lot of things practically, and I can't go through them in detail in this short talk. Uh, one is just the fact that light scatters off molecules. So our laser beam, if it, if it hits molecules on the way to the mirrors at the far end of the interferometer, find a path length that's longer than a straight line. So we have to use high vacuum. And we have the largest high vacuum system in the world, 16 kilometers, 1.2. Uh, meters in, in uh, diameter and running at 10 to the minus 9 tor. The, uh, so that's the first problem. The second is the laser. The laser has to be a lot better than the one I hold in my hand. Uh, more powerful, certainly, and stabilized, tremendously stabilized so that we can control it in wavelength, amplitude, direction, and so forth. And we do a lot of special work to do that. The third thing that limits us, and it's the one to focus on because it's what enabled this uh, discovery, is seismic noise. I told you already we have to be able to get rid of seismic noise at the level of 10 to the 12th, reduce the shaking of the earth at 10 to the 12th, where we study things at maybe 40 or 50 hertz. Uh, the next one is the fact that we work at room temperature. In the future, we are likely to see gravitational wave detectors, either our own or others that have been cooled to make them quieter at low temperature. And then finally, you want to have as many photons as you can have to sample this as well as you can. But to do that, you put pressure, that puts pressure on the mirrors. And so we have something called a quantum noise problem where we have to balance uh, the pressure on the mirrors against how many photons uh, we use. If you put that all together, we get a sensitivity region that looks like the plot here. We're basically, we don't do anything audio, but we're in the audio region. And this is the seismic noise shaken to the earth. This is the number of photons you have. And this is the thermal noise. Those are the primary, uh, primary uh, factors that limit us. And below that lurks all the other things that I, that I talked about. What we did is build this between 1995 and 2000. And during that period, during the time after that, we made it work, work like an interferometer, look for gravitational waves in the sensitivity region, didn't find any, uh, turned off, did everything we could to make it better, and did it over and over again. We did that for seven times over 10 years, and we never saw gravitational waves. So at that point, we had gotten to the best we could do in design sensitivity, the limiting factors, except at the very lowest fre frequencies, and this is the very last sensitivity curves that we have. So it looks like the plot that I had, thermal, uh, seismic noise, thermal noise, shot noise. The two colors here are just two optical configurations that we used. And the little vertical lines that stand up are just natural resonances in the system, electrical or mechanical. Uh, they represent about 1% of the frequency band, and we notch those away when we analyze the data. Our goal was to build a new version of LIGO in the same infrastructure that would be 10 times better. At high frequencies, we do that by a higher power laser. In the middle frequencies, by better test masses and suspensions. At the lower frequencies, by isolating ourselves better from the Earth. The one I'll concentrate on only because of time is the isolation from the Earth. Because if you want to take away the elevator speech of how we made the discovery, this is it. So. The idea is that we have to isolate ourselves from the Earth. How do we do that? 
We do it every day when we ride in our cars, basically in the same scheme. We have shock absorbers in our cars that take a bump that's high frequency, can't get rid of the energy, just puts it at low frequency, and we smoothly go over the bump. We made as good a shock absorber as you can imagine, very specially squishy and so forth, four layers of it, so what escaped one layer was in the second layer, third layer, fourth layer, and fifth layer. During the 10 years when we ran, that's what we had, and we couldn't do any better than that, and that gave us a factor of 10 to the 10th. Remember the factor of 10 to the 12th that we need. The factor of 10 to the 10th wasn't good enough, so what we added in advanced LIGO was what we call active seismic isolation. For you, think about the earphones you wear in an airplane that measure the ambient noise and cancel it. In our case, we measure the ambient shaking. It's harder, we have to tell the direction and correct for it so that the mirror doesn't get moved in any direction at all. That brought us down to 10 to the 12th. This is the sensitivity compared to where we were after 10 years. And you can see the two colors on the bottom one are the same, are different, but the curves look the same. And we had improved by about a factor of three at high frequencies, but at low frequencies, because of the active isolation, by a factor of 100. And it's the reason in a few days why we could make an observation with the improved LIGO that we weren't able to do in years before. And this is what we found. We started running in September 2015, and within a few days, we saw a signal first in Livingston, Louisiana on the left, and then 6.7 uh, milliseconds later, a signal in uh, Hanford, Washington that looks to your eyeballs identical. Uh, if I actually then take those signals, I don't have time to go through it in detail and calculate using general relativity what they look like. The signals are the top band, the raw signals, the calculations of general relativity in the second band, subtracting one from the other to see the residuals or whether the, how well it fits here. And that's basically the, uh, the data that we have or evidence of gravitational waves from this merger, which is, we identified as a merger of two black holes, each about 30 solar masses. This is a picture then of, the, of it coming together, but I only want to draw your attention to the very bottom to show that these objects are a distance apart of only a couple hundred uh, kilometers when we see them and merging and going at a velocity of about half the speed of light. So that's what you have to imagine. Each one of them weighing 10 million times the mass of the Earth. We can take those waveforms and analyze them in detail. I don't have time to go through it today, but we, this is a formula for what's called the chirp mass. And we can tell the masses of the two particles in principle, the, 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 the frequencies, the spins, the distance away by the amplitude, and so forth. And that's the kind of analysis that we have done. Uh, we've now seen five events, of which four we declare uh, that we've reported, that we declare as uh, black hole mergers, all that look very different from each other. So this is one this lower mass and stays in the apparatus much longer, going to higher frequency. This is the original uh, event. Uh, I want to end, uh, and just let me comment that we use this, this data to test general relativity. So for example, in this plot here, what we've done is add a dispersion term and ask whether the, you can still fit the data that we have. We can't if this dispersion term has any uh, decent size. If you take the limit on this dispersion term form that I use here, of uh, uh, yeah, you get the basically uh, formula for uh, a graviton that has some mass, and we're able to put a limit. It's incredibly small: 10 to the minus 27, 10 to the minus 23 eV over c squared. The black holes that we found are were not expected. Uh, they're much too heavy, and the reason they're that weren't expected is heavy stars don't hang together very well, so how could they be enough of them around to give black holes? Uh, we've shown that they exist, um, that they f exist and form into binary pairs, that they merge within the lifetime of the universe, and uh, that they have masses that are much larger than was originally expected. 
I, I want to end by just showing very quickly the last thing that we saw. Last fall, we reported for the first time seeing something other than the black hole mergers, and that's the merger of objects that actually have mass and not our objects like black holes, and that's the merger of two neutron stars. That's shown here, uh, where the time frequency signal is on the left, and using that itself, we determined by what I showed you before, the masses of the objects and the uh, uh, distance away, which was about 60 megaparsecs. Two seconds later, 1.7 seconds later, the same object was observed in the Fermi satellite uh, as a short gamma ray burst. We uh, were able to, s to point to where it was in the sky by the addition of a, a new interferometer in Italy, and they were in the same section of the eye. That enabled us to turn on astronomers to point instruments from around the world at this and from that, um, much physics, which I can't talk about, has come out. It's what we now call multi-messenger astronomy. This is just a composite of that. Uh, basically, the phenomenology of what happens when neutron star mergers, which we had been developed phenomenologically, called uh, kilonova, it looks pretty good with all this data that's been shown. Secondly, uh, some interesting phenomena, and I'll end on this, have come out, and that is we've had a puzzle forever of where the heavy elements come from in the Earth. We know how to make them in the lab, but in the Earth, where did gold come from? Where did platinum come from? Uh, we know that most of the universe is made up of hydrogen and helium. We get heavier elements due to the fusion process in stars. So we can get up to iron or something like that uh, by the normal mechanisms, but how do we get the heavier ones? In the labs, we make the heavy ones and fill out the periodic table by bombarding heavy elements with new, lots of neutrons. Well, there's no better possibility to do that than the collision of two neutron stars. So although the favorite story has always been that it comes from a supernova, it now appears more likely that the gold that's in the ring that you're wearing on your finger, the yellow parts here are the phenomenology of what probably came from neutron stars, came from collisions like the one we observed last fall. So with that, I'll, uh, I'll end. Is there a mechanism for questions or? Okay, I'm, I'm I'm here for questions if anybody. I don't know if there's mics out there somewhere. Could you ask to go to the microphone? There's a question over here. The question is from the two measurements that you said from the gravity wave and then the multi-messenger wave. Did you reestablish the propagation of gravity wave? Yeah, so the que the question is uh, I glibly said that there's one speed in Einstein's equations, that's the speed of light which is called the speed of light because that's all we had then, but it's also the speed of gravitational radiation in the, in the theory. It turns out that since the last thing I showed, which is the collision of two neutron stars, was seen by us and then 1.7 seconds later in an a experiment that saw gamma rays from the same source, and that was 100 billion light years away, it's a pretty good restriction on how, what the velocity of light has to, what the velocity of gravitational waves have to be, which is certainly consistent with the speed of light. I had a question for you, if I could. Uh, so you mentioned that you produced a theoretical solution to match the signal that LIGO received, and that solution involved the merger of two black holes with about 30 solar masses. Yes. Is, it, is that the only collection of parameters that would have given you that solution, or could they have been different sized objects? Yeah. Uh, well, we, we give it with error bars. I didn't have time to show you that. Uh, let, me, let me just reflect on what we do. We, we basically are able to look for uh, any merger of two object, compact objects that come into our frequency band. 
that turns out to be between, say, 1 and 100 times the mass of our sun, or maybe a little less. Than. So if we make a two-dimensional plot of, of that, it's two objects, uh, it can be anywhere in that plane. I could have one object that's heavy, one object that's light, and so forth. What we do is use general relativity and uh, to calculate every point in that in a grid that's fine enough so nothing can escape in between, and that's how we do our searching. That searching has about 300,000 uh, templates that we compare with every strip of data. The only, and so when we get something, it fits some place, which is actually there, but with errors, depending on what, what adjoining bins could also satisfy it or not satisfy it. So we have, if you read the paper, we have errors. They're, the errors on, on the masses are pretty good, good enough so that we can determine how much energy got uh, sent away in gravitational radiation. So in the case of the first two, it was 32 and 29, actually, and three, three solar masses of energy disappeared in the form of gravitational radiation, all within a couple tenths of a second. Thank you. Yeah, uh, that, there's a new paper. I, I actually, we haven't studied it well enough to comment on it yet, but there is a paper where somebody was troubled also that it was heavy and felt that the, the reason it looks that way has to do with the lensing. And I, I can't comment further. I, I am aware of the paper. As a Caltech undergraduate, both you and your work have been very inspirational for me. And I was wondering if you could say a few words of having seen black holes and neutron star mergers, where LIGO is looking next? Uh, thanks. I didn't have time to do that. Uh, we're completely limited by not our creativity in looking for gravitational waves. We are somewhat, but basically in the sensitivity of the instrument that we have. And we've now gotten to the place where we're able to, it's a little bit like uh, Galileo in 1609, who looked through the first telescope and saw uh, that Jupiter had four moons. And astronomy's gone a long way since then. We're basically now barely able to detect gravitational waves. So the progress in the field is mostly, I think, going to come from making the instruments better. Fortunately, we're not limited by fundamental things. We don't know how to make it quickly much, much better because we have technological problems we have to solve. But we're not limited by some backgrounds from the Earth or some other uh, backgrounds that are problems. So what I think will happen over the coming decades is that we'll make more and more sensitive gravitational wave detectors. We gain very quickly because let me point out from the very first slide or second slide I showed that we measure this little h mu nu. So we measure an amplitude, not a power. Because of that, if we improve the apparatus sensitivity a factor of two, we look two times further out into the universe which means eight times more uh, galaxies and so forth that we cover. So improvements in the sensitivity are the key to the future, and I believe they'll happen. Lastly, it's going to be done in complementary wavelengths, just like astronomy is, and we can look forward to an experiment called LISA, which is being presently funded by the European Space Agency, but NASA will probably join after our success. And uh, that should go in different frequency bands than ours in the 2030s. So I think we'll see in gravitational waves a coverage of different frequencies and much better sensitivity in time. Thank you.